there are five biblical keys that the Bible gives the believer as the keys that will help them to experience victory in spite of or in the midst of challenges. Are you ready for the five keys? Pray in the spirit for one minute and ask the Lord to open your understanding. Give us understanding even by your word. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, the righteous businessman, the righteous apostle, the righteous prophet, the righteous mother, the righteous student, the righteous politician, even the righteous nation. Hallelujah. Key number one. Key number one. Are you ready? The first key that the Bible gives, now you must understand that the word of God is not a recommendation. That the word of God is not an opinion. It may look like a recommendation. It may look like an opinion. But for the believer who wants to walk perpetually in victory, the word of God is life. The word of God is instruction. It says, my son, pay attention to my words. Incline your ears to my sayings. It says, do not let them depart from your heart. Keep them in the midst of your, your, your mouth. Keep them in the midst of your heart. It said, they are life. Not to everybody. To those that find them and health even to their flesh so you must take the word of God as final authority as touching anything the word of God presents the mind of God concerning any and all matters are we together number one the first key any believer any righteous person who is going through a season of affliction doesn't matter what it is called the first recommendation from scripture is to look unto Jesus please write as simple as that sounds do not assume you understand what I'm saying just write and listen to look on to Jesus to look on to Jesus now we can read Psalm 34 beginning from verse 1 look on to Jesus it says I will bless the Lord at all times his praise shall continually be in my mouth verse 2 my soul shall make her boast in the Lord the humble shall hear of and hear thereof and be glad verse 3 it says oh magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together for I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Five, it says they looked unto him. Is that in your Bible? And they were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. Verse six, it says the poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Reading to 10, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him him and delivered them verse 8 it says oh taste and see that the Lord is good blessed is the man that trusted in him verse 9 oh fear the Lord ye his saints for there is no want to them that fear him final verse the young lions do lack and suffer hunger it says but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing say loud amen, amen. hallelujah so the Bible says to look unto Jesus. You find that in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, he says, the author and the finisher of our faith. Please look up. I can tell you it is very difficult to look unto Jesus in the face of challenges, tribulations. What does it mean to look? Now pay attention. To look means to direct one's gaze and focus towards someone or something that's what it means to look to look means to direct one's gaze to direct one's focus away from other things towards someone or towards something but then to look also means to rely on or to depend totally upon when the bible says look unto jesus Number one, it means to set your gaze upon him, not wavering whatsoever. But number two, it means to depend and rely totally upon him. Even when you do not understand him, look unto Jesus. The biblical recommendation for managing seasons and moments of affliction. Look unto Jesus, the Bible says. 
There is a very strange and interesting story. You find that in Numbers chapter 21 from verse 4 down to 9. The Bible talks about the nation of Israel that when they came by the way of the Red Sea, the Bible says to compass the land of Edom. The soul of the people was discouraged because they kept walking endlessly and it looked like there was no victory, no rest for them. They were hungry, they were angry, and the trouble started from verse 5. Reading to verse 9, the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, there is no water, and our soul loathed this light bread. Verse 6, the Bible says the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they beat the people and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. He says, pray unto the Lord that he takes away the serpent from us. And Moses prayed for the people. How did God answer the prayer? The Lord instructed Moses and said, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole and it shall come to pass that everyone that is beaten when he looketh upon it shall live. What kind of an instruction is that? What is the relationship between a serpent, a brazen serpent, and healing, and life, and victory? It was not about the serpent. He was teaching them that there is life and dominion in trusting God's plan, in trusting God's way. As foolish as it is, once it is God that has spoken, he's saying even in the midst of the fiery serpents, the wisest thing to do in front of a snake is to run away, not to look. Hallelujah. It is stupid for someone to sit down and watch a serpent curl around you. Are we together now? And it's about to kill you. The wisest human instruction is to run away, not to look at some serpent somewhere. And yet, that is the foolishness of God's path. He was teaching them that the ways of God may not make sense, but in them there is life. Look and leave, my brother, leave. Look to Jesus Christ and leave. It is recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and leave. Apostle, you have no idea what is happening in my life right now. It's on account of my faith in Jesus that I'm in this trouble right now. Look to Jesus. Hallelujah. To depend upon him. Psalm 1, 2, 3 from verse 1 and 2. 1, 23, 1 and 2. The Bible says, Unto thee lift I up mine eyes. O thou that dwellest in the heavens, verse 2, it says, Behold, as the eyes of the servant look upon the hand of their masters, it says, And as the eyes of the maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon thee, O Lord, until that he have mercy upon us. Can I tell you? There's no time, but probably let me just give you three scriptures that helps us to know why should you look unto Jesus. Number one is found in Psalm 127. I hope I've not lost you. We're still looking at the first reason or the first recommendation from Scripture to look to Jesus. Psalm 127 from verse 1 and 2 says, Except the Lord builds a house, I am showing you why you need to look unto Jesus, that they labor in vain that build it, and except the Lord keepeth the city, the watchman walketh but in vain. Verse 2 says, it is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrow, for he giveth his beloved sleep. Why do we need to look unto Jesus? Romans chapter 9 and verse 16. It says, It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but it is of the Lord that showeth mercy. That means no matter what else you do, you can stretch your human imagination from border to border. If God does not show you mercy, everything you are doing will end up being moving around in circles. Hallelujah. Why do we need to look unto Jesus? Psalm 62 and verse 11. I have spoken once 
And twice have ye heard that power belongeth to God. When you look unto Jesus, you are looking unto the only person, the only God who has the power to do something about your situation. My Bible tells me some trust in horses and some trust in chariots. It says, but we will trust in the name of our God. This is true. Men can want to help. They may be sincere on that, but do they have the power? Hallelujah. Someone say, look unto Jesus. Let me give you one more scripture. Why do you need to look unto Jesus at times of adversary? At times of pain, Psalm 133 from verse 1. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is. Psalm 113, my apologies, 113, 113, 113. Praise ye the Lord, praise ye his, the servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord, verse 2. It says, blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth forever, verse 3. It says, from the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Uh -huh. We're reading to verse 9. The Lord is high above all the nations and his glory above the heavens. Watch this now. It says, who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high? Verse 6. Who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and are in earth? 7. Who raised the poor? I'm showing you why you need to look unto Jesus. God is the only one who can raise men, the poor, out of the dust and lifted the needy out of the dunghill. That he may set him to sit with princes, even the princes of his people. Verse 9. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. This is what he can do. When you look unto Jesus, it may sound like foolishness in the midst of challenges because there are many times I have taught you here when God is silent, the most difficult phase in the believer's life is when God is silent. Even though he is the word, there are times God is mysteriously silent. And I've taught you that the silence of God is also a language. You must know what God is saying when he's not speaking. Because when God is not speaking, he's saying something. Look unto Jesus. Now, let me give you a word of caution. We're looking at five keys. And the Spirit of God had to put it in my heart to write this down. According to Matthew 11 and verse 6, it says, Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Can I tell you? If you've not had the temptation to be offended in God, it's either you are really a baby or you've not lived long enough on this earth. Because there are moments in your life when you feel, it's, it's almost as if you feel cheated for loving Jesus. Are we together? Yeah. John came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Watch this. John was the prophet who ordained Jesus to ministry. It was revealed to John. John had the secret code that would identify Jesus. When he saw Jesus by prophecy, he said, Behold the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Now John is locked up, caught see Herodias, the daughter of as a birthday gift he was locked up and was about to be beheaded in anger when the disciples came to him you know what he said the same person who identified Jesus who announced him he said go and ask him are you the Messiah or should we expect another that is what offense can do the man who ordained Jesus in ministry in fact he trained some of the disciples who would later be the disciples of Jesus and yet he said Jesus for I, I've, my pain vetoes every vision I have about you. My pain vetoes anything God told me about you. I am in a moment of pain. You claim to be the Messiah and now I am locked up in prison and you do not even have the courtesy to come and visit me. I hear a rumor that as a birthday gift, my head is going and you do not even show any sign of concern. Take that message to your Jesus. 
the disciples come to Jesus in a crusade ground and say, sir, we don't mean to embarrass you, but there's a serious situation. The man who announced you most, the man who cried out and said he was the voice who was sent to bear witness to you is in total doubt of you right now. What can destroy a man's ministry more than somebody who loved you and endorsed you openly and is now saying, go, I'm not even sure of what I laid hands on. And the Bible says, Jesus, with calmness and intelligence, he turned and began to lay hands, healed a few people. He said, go and tell John what you see. The blind see, the deaf hear, and so on and so forth. The gospel is preached. Then he says, 11 verse 6 now, Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Lord, where were you when I was losing my job? Where were the angels of protection when my loved one was being attacked by terrorists or died in a car crash? I don't mean to get you emotional, but I'm just, I'm discussing on the afflictions of the righteous. Lord, where were you? When for the sake of my integrity as a man of God, I seem to have gone down. Where were you when Potiphar's wife was all around Joseph and because of his integrity, he didn't go to the palace, he went to the prison. The afflictions of the righteous. How do you explain Joseph holding a woman's, uh, the wife's, um, what they call it now? her veil or whatever it is he was holding. How could he say that he did not have anything to do with her? That was evidence enough. And yet God was watching in heaven. How do you explain Hannah crying year after year, going to Shiloh? How do you explain that? How do you explain God's people under the rule and bondage of the Egyptians? Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Let me tell you this. The believer is not a believer because of results. The believer is a believer because you have committed yourself to trust in Jesus. Hallelujah. Look unto Jesus is the first biblical recommendation. I've had very painful experiences in the lives of people as I, as I serve the purposes of God. And sometimes, you know, when they can't see Jesus, you who is the closest to him based on what they perceive, whatever they would have told him is what they tell you. Hallelujah. Since I cannot see Jesus, you claim to be the one who has come in his name, you better be prepared to help me convey to Jesus. And I will tell you loud and clear, where was he when this happened? I know many people who I called in maybe the face of bereavement and whatever and I say, can we say a word of prayer and they say, Apostle, with all due respect, please do not talk to me about anything prayer now. And I know that they don't mean it. It's just what pain can do. Hallelujah. I heard about the story of someone who had an accident and he had to rush out and he stood watching his car burn and it burned to ashes, there was absolutely nothing he would have done. And that was a car that was like two months old. What was the value of dedicating the car in church? They poured oil on that car and it still burned after two months. How about the business of believers that went down from COVID? And some of those people were great sponsors of the gospel. Now, just follow me. I'm a good pilot who will land well. You just follow me. Hallelujah. Mm. How about a man of God who gathered sick people and shouted in the name of the Lord that they will be healed and laid hands on them one by one till they arrested him and threw him out of that place. And he left that crusade ground as if he was leaving a funeral. Where is the Jesus I kept shouting and talking about? Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not just playing with words, nor am I playing with your mind. I'm revealing something that may be someone's situation right now. And you know, in the midst of challenges, you forget every title you have. You forget every, even Jesus wept. Very disturbing scripture. John eleven thirty five. If you see Jesus weeping, will you not cry too? That means you are in trouble. John eleven thirty five. The comforter of those who were always weeping is now weeping. 
it doesn't matter why he's weeping. The fact that you saw tears coming out of his eyes. Hallelujah. Life wept. Hope wept. Victory wept. The fountain of wisdom wept. Weeping always carries a, a picture of limitation. When people weep, it seems to communicate hopelessness or despair. And the Bible says Jesus wept. As God, he never cried. But when he became a man, he cried. Jesus was angry. The Bible does not hide his frustrations. He went into the temple and flogged people in anger. He caused a fig tree because he was hungry. And came to the tree and the tree would not deliver. And he caused that tree. Look to Jesus. Listen to me. There will be moments in your life where you truly will not be able to find answers intellectually. That's why there is a realm of peace that surpasses all understanding. That means that peace is beyond the realm of arguing what is this, what is that. Remember at the apex of, of, of Job's problem, the wife was even confused. She said, curse God and die. And Job said, no, why do you speak like one of these foolish women? He said, all the days of my appointed time, I will wait. I don't know what is happening to me. Different people came and started communicating several opinions. And Eli, who one time shot them, and he said, you guys, I respect you. I wanted to speak, but I have a limitation in age. He said, but there is a spirit in man. And the inspiration of the Almighty maketh men of understanding. Job himself, who encouraged himself in the Lord, got to a point where he was angry. And when you read chapter 38, the Bible said he summoned God. He said, God, I've finished comforting myself. We need to talk. Please come and explain to me the reason behind this pain. And the Bible says God came in a whirlwind and a discussion began. Hallelujah. Look unto Jesus. Number two, depend on him. Number two now, let me give you number two. Commit to prayer, even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of hopelessness, even in the midst of despair. Commit to prayer. That is the second point. James chapter 5 and verse 13. James 5, 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray, the Bible says. Let him pray. When you see afflictions, you see despair, you see all kinds of things. He says to pray. It is difficult to pray when you are in pain. That is where spirituality is tested. Lord, I do not know what is happening, but I pray. I pray. Hallelujah. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. He says pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Pray without ceasing. Someone say prayer. Shout it again, say prayer. prayer. Prayer is very, very powerful. When you do not know what to do, pray. It is in the place of prayer that direction comes. When you do not know what to do, pray. Pray even in the spirit, pray in your understanding. I don't know where the solution to these bills will come from. There is already a death sentence around my life and my children health-wise. You do not know what to do, pray. The Bible says the biblical recommendation for managing affliction is to pray. Man of God, pray. Businessman, pray. It does not take a certificate to pray. It takes hunger and passion and the recognition that there is a God that rules over the affairs of men. Say pray. pray. Commit to prayer. That is the second biblical key. Every time you do not know what is happening in your life, that is not the time to start running from pillar to post, discussing things with people who don't have the power to solve your problem. Can I tell you the truth? Running around will only deplete the energy that is left. Use that same energy, lock the door, and begin to pray. And sometimes, you honestly may not know how to pray. You may allow your tears do the prayer. And while you sing, or you may allow prayer to just come from any material while you you soak in the glory there pray 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 
I thought I would get the job. Now, this is the 10th year, 15th year, 5th year without a job. Pray. Someone in the hospital has already said, forget about me. Just focus on the children. As for me, I am going. Pray. Listen to what I am telling you and please take it seriously. Pray. Man of God, since pandemic, it looks like your ministry just went down. The key is to pray. Discussion may be consoling, but you have to pray. You can pray yourself to comfort. You can pray yourself to faith. Prayer is like exercise. Nobody likes it, but you have to start. Once you start, something happens to you. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to What a privilege to carry everything most people will do any other thing but pray they will cry which is human and which is okay but they will not pray prayer has nothing to do with um, whether you have the appetite and the desire, it is a requirement. You must pray. Number three, let's hurry up. Is God speaking to someone? Number one, look to Jesus, meaning depend on him even when you do not understand him. The word trust is the word bata, trust in the Lord. That means to throw yourself at him, expecting him to hold you. And like the Hebrew boys, that even if you do not deliver us, O King, we have made a determination that as far as Jesus, as far as God is concerned, we will not bow. That's why you see conditional Christianity is dangerous. The kind of Christianity that says, God, I will only serve you based on the fact that you bless me. No. God is a covenant-keeping God, but our love for Jesus and our love for the things of the Spirit must be beyond the results that come. That even if I'm in the midst of fire and rescue does not come, let it be that I die trusting him. Are we together? Number three, what is the third approach to dealing with afflictions as a believer? Are you ready? Meditate upon and speak the word over that situation. Meditate upon and speak the word over that situation. Meditate upon and speak the word over that situation. Joel chapter 3 and verse 10. Joel chapter 3 and verse 10. Joel, Joel, J-O-E-L, chapter 3 and verse 10. It says, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. It says, let the weak say. Hold on. Where do you have the strength to say when you are weak? There is always strength to say, even when there is no strength to do. You may not have the strength to do, but God will always ensure that the strength to say remains with you. That when you lose every kind of strength, there is within your spirit man the strength to say. The strength to say gives you the strength to do. Let the weak say let those who are crying say let those who are discouraged say that means in the mind of God there is no situation that happens to the believer that should make him lose the ability to say there is always strength enough to say let the weak say I am strong he never said, let the weak say strength. I am strong to personalize it and to believe it. Let the weak say, I am strong. Isaiah 3 and verse 10. Isaiah 3 and verse 10. Say unto the righteous, the same righteous with many afflictions. He said, say to that righteous, that it shall be well with him. Someone say it must be well with me. In fact, say it is well with me. Prophesy to yourself, say in the name of Jesus, I decree and declare that it is well with me. 
don't mind what the devil is saying say in the name of Jesus I decree and declare that it is well with me say unto the righteous that it shall be well with them yes I know I will come out of this let the weak say I am strong let the person in debt say I will come out of it in the name of Jesus because thanks be to God that causes us to triumph say unto the one who has lost the breadwinner in their family father is gone mother is gone and you are alone I may not see wind I may not see rain but one thing I know is that my valley shall be filled with water because there is Abba the one who never dies and the Bible says that if he can clothe the lilies of the valley and feed the birds that do not sow and do not reap they are violating a fundamental spiritual law yet in it they never lack hallelujah meditate on and speak the word can I tell you when you learn to speak the word is not a Pentecostal suggestion speaking the word is part of the frame do you know God is very powerful and he has taught us the Bible says he created us in his image and in his likeness his likeness means to function like him and all through scripture we see God create by speaking he blesses by speaking he restores by speaking he lifts by speaking every time God opens his mouth something leaves his mouth that ministers life to creation the Bible says even for man that he breathed upon that man to breathe upon the man does not mean he used his nose he opened his mouth and life came and entered into that man are we together speak the word Psalm 107 from verse 2 and 3 Psalm 107 from verse 2 and 3 let the redeemed of the Lord say so let the blessed of the Lord say so let the healed of the Lord say so. Let the lifted of the Lord say so. It's not enough to know so. You must say so. Whom he had redeemed from the hand of the enemy, verse 3. It says, and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west and the north and the south. Say so say so in the name of Jesus I'm coming out of this situation in the name of Jesus the Lord is my light and my salvation of whom shall I be afraid of I may not understand what is happening to me but in the name of Jesus the Bible says all things work together for my good I expect glory at the end of this confusion I may not know what the process is all about but I know the end that the end is glory and is glorious and upon that I place my faith learn to say so Learn to say so. You don't say what is happening. You say what the word of God says. Hallelujah. Meditate upon and speak the word over that situation. Is someone learning? That means as you return back now, you can carry whatever is the, is the basis for the challenge, the affliction, whatever it is. You continue to make declarations. Even if it looks like it's a hopeless situation, like death, because the most um, the, the, the most hopeless thing that can happen to a man as far as this side of God's kingdom is concerned is that the person passes on to glory. So physically you may not see the person again. Even at that, you may not have the person back again but you can decree and declare in the name of Jesus. I know that the comfort of the spirit is at work in this family. It may be a difficult thing but by the power of the Holy Spirit with each passing day strength is released upon us and whatever role that person played in the name of Jesus God will come through God will raise men in multiplied ways to play that role see there is a way the believer was designed to function when you allow emotions to drive the vehicle of your Christian life you will end up being a disaster sincerely so you will need to push emotions aside and peg yourself at the Word of God no matter what you feel that which God said you must say are we together the word confession comes from the word homologio. It means repeat as you have heard. And the purpose of repeating it is for creation, not just for emphasis. I prophesied as I was commanded and there was a sound. Is someone learning already? I'm giving you biblical keys. Number one, I said, look unto Jesus, depend totally upon him. Number two, commit to prayer. Number three, meditate upon and speak the word of God over that situation. 
over that situation because every situation has an ear and believe me when I tell you it can hear the word of the Lord are you ready for number number four now listen carefully please listen carefully number four seek comfort prayer and help from friends and the family of believers I will take it slowly seek comfort the righteous now in the midst of affliction seek comfort comma prayer and help from godly friends and from the family of believers this is you can start this because it is a very major secret to overcoming afflictions seek comfort prayers and help from friends and the family of believers in Acts chapter 4 when we read from verse 21 please give us Acts chapter 4 and verse 21 remember when Peter and John were threatened as a result of the man at Gate Beautiful who had been healed so when they had further threatened them it says they let them go finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people for all men glorified God for that which was done next verse it says for the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed 23 and being let go they went to their own company everybody said their own company so they had a larger community of believers where they could resort to to find company the bible says and they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had done and together as a company Verse 24 now, the Bible says when they heard the company, they lifted their voice. Say they. Not just the one person. He came to a company of believers and they could find comfort. They could pray together. They lifted up their voice unto God with one accord. Listen, many believers do not survive afflictions and tragedies and negative situations because they lack these four points many believers do not have a larger company of friends and like-minded believers did you know it is a terrible thing for a believer to not be connected to a larger body of believers because when when disaster strikes like this no matter how powerful you are you will need the company of believers to shield you and encourage you there are times the sermon you hear will not come from yourself it will come from someone else speaking to you are we learning first Thessalonians 5 and verse 25 it said brethren pray for us there are times that as much as you may want to pray for yourself, you may not have that energy. But there should be some brethren that you can honestly say pray for us. Even though we are apostles, do you have the brethren that can pray for you? Do you have the brethren that can love you, that can come and shield you? Hallelujah. Philippians 1.19. Philippians 1.19. For I know, Paul is speaking, that this shall turn to my salvation. How? Through your prayer. Paul, the prayer warrior, is saying, I require the prayer and the shield of other believers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. For this fourth point, I wrote something very interesting here, and I please want you to listen. I said, living an isolated Christian life will not profit you in the day of adversity living an isolated Christian life hallelujah an isolated Christian life in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 when you read from verse 9 to 12 it talks about the power of unity two are better than one it says because they have a good reward for their labor reading to verse 12 for if they fall one will lift up his fellow but woe to him that is alone when he falleth for he had not another to help him up it says and again if two lie together then they have heat but how can one be warm alone verse 12 now it says and if one prevail against him it says two shall withstand him and a threefold cord is not easily broken living an isolated Christian life will not profit you in the day of adversity can I tell you 
having brethren, having godly friends, and having a family of believers who love you and know you and support you will require you sowing seeds of love, sowing seeds of care, and sowing seeds of help to believers too. You have to make those investments waiting for these days. Now, let me tell you the truth. The proof of your being connected to a spiritual family is not attendance, it's genuine connection. Connection that is proven by service and your own impute also. Attendance does not mean you have a spiritual family. Have you registered your impact by registering your love, by registering your care? Who knows you are there? Who has been a beneficiary of your kindness? There are many people who attend believer meetings, but nobody knows them enough to come and knock on their door and say, I heard that you have been crying for the past two days. You have blessed me too much. I will not leave this place. Your home is my home. Your tears is my tears. Let me tell you, woe betides a man who has not spent his life investing and sowing seeds of love, seeds of kindness, because you will find, do you know, there are believers who go through pain and they go through it alone because they have not made any commitment to anyone nor any spiritual family enough. No track record of service, no track record of giving, no track record of prayer, no track record of support. They just freelance participation, unfortunately, for those people who are betides that believer. Do you know there are many believers who have cheaply come out of affliction because of the power of a larger body of believers? Why is your face gloomy like this? I've not been able to pay my rent. I'm not an irresponsible person. It's just that things have been happening in my life. How much is the rent? Ah, I'm even afraid to say it. It's 1.5 million. And you may not even know the person you are talking to. He will say, come and see me tomorrow. You thought he will give you rent. He will give you the key of a house. And say, I have watched you. Every time when it's time to collect offering, I see your service in the house of God. I, you always have that smile, that glow when people are sad. I've taught you that challenges are as large as the ignorance of the victims. You see, invest in strategic relationships. There are many of you who will not call on anybody. When you hear that people are sick, it's none of your business. When you hear that someone is in trouble, it's none of, once it does not affect you, it is none of your business. No. Rejoice with them that rejoice. Weep with them that weep. And you'll be making investments and you will be surprised. Moments where you need help, the body will come and wrap their hands around you and say, no, let that sword pierce us instead of touching you. You have made too much commitment. There was a woman in the Bible, you remember? That some, a woman who died in the Bible and people came and said, look at what she, this woman cannot die. Who will continue doing this? Can I tell you, you can prolong your life using your kindness and benevolence. Your contribution to the program of God can be so significant. God will not allow any devil to take your life. Are we together? This will require you sowing seeds of love, sowing seeds of care, sowing seeds of help to many believers matthew chapter 5 and verse 7 it says blessed are the merciful jesus was teaching he says for they shall obtain mercy galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 there is such a concept as the household of faith it says as we therefore as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good to all men. Say, do good to all men. Then it says, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Can I tell you, you have heard me say it, but let me repeat it. If your absence is not missed, it means that your presence was not contributing much. You know that you are an active contributor to the program of God because people should be able to detect your absence. Where is that lady who always smiles on Sunday, whose glow can even, if you are sad and you look at that lady, where is she? And someone says she lost her mom. He said, well, I don't know her, but let me know where. Can I send something to that lady? 
Believers are quick to wrap their hands around people who become active contributors to the growth of others. There are others, listen to what I'm telling you. This is very powerful. It is a terrible thing to not have a friend, to not have somebody who loves you and believes in you, who can cry. You see believers go through situations alone. No. Let me repeat number four again for emphasis. Seek comfort, prayers, and help from godly friends and then from the family of believers. It's a culture in this ministry to make sure that all who are genuinely connected to this ministry as much as possible are shown the care and the love that is needed as much as God can grant us grace to do. I do not believe in using people. I believe in people being blessed. And for as long as God grants us the grace, we'll continue to extend hands of love and benevolence all wise as much as God grants us grace. Hallelujah. Growing up, I used to wonder why our parents and elderly people, every wedding you see them there, every burial, and you are wondering, what, is it that you know everybody? They return back and they say, I'm traveling somewhere. Who is getting married again? Uh, one woman like this, I used to know her in 1971. I heard that her last one is getting married. And that's why you are traveling to the south. They return back. They are moving from pillar to post. And in our foolishness as children, we thought they were just wasting time. Can I tell you, you know how much you are invest, you've invested in people because like Gideon, when you blow that trumpet, 33,000 people should show up. Why are you crying? My child has not been able to go to school. No, not under my watch. Please allow this. I will leave this child's education to me. I remember when I was in primary school. I remember you were there for me. Can I tell you the truth? The law of seed time and harvest works powerfully. Powerfully. There are many today, your carelessness of yesterday has become a padlock to your destiny. It locked your destiny and threw the key away. That every time you want to move the memories of your carelessness of yesteryears, I'm praying in this service in the name of Jesus that the God of all mercy will show someone mercy. Amen. You believe that? Shout a loud amen. amen. The body of believers. Don't just be an attendant. Be connected genuinely in truth. There is always something that you can do to add to the smiles of believers and build quality, godly relationships. How do you do that? By being friendly, I have taught you. And by being an active contributor to the growth of people. Practice the law of honor. Don't downplay and demean people and expect them to invest their time and attention during the days of adversity. No. People will reciprocate based on their perception of who they think you are. Are we together? This is very, very important. As tired as I can be sometimes, there are people, if I see their call and I, I see their text, I will make efforts to get up and respond. Why? Because I love everybody. But the truth is that their participation and their contribution in my life is not at the same level. Are we together now? Yes. What investments are you making now for those days? Man of God, does somebody believe in you enough to say I will never watch you in shame? No matter what it is, I will come and wrap my arms around you and make sure that I stand by you to see that this rent issue or this financial issue gets out of the way. Can I tell you, depending on yourself by yourself to come out of affliction and challenges may end up burying you there. Sometimes you will need, even if you are Jesus, you will need Simon of Cyrene to help you carry that cross to Golgotha. And woe betides even a savior who does not have help. Is someone learning? Build godly relationships. Be kind. Be loving. Don't just be anointed. Don't just be a prayer warrior. Don't just be a word giant. In the face of affliction, people do not care. I have taught you, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People will not come to help you just because you're a prayer giant, just because you're a word giant. Sometimes it's that sense of compassion and honor and empathy 
and you will be surprised how people will arise to come to your rescue. May you never lack helpers. I'm prophesying to you that in the name of Jesus Christ, may you never lack helpers. That at every point in your life, may there be someone who can arise genuinely and sincerely. I've taught you in discussing destiny helpers, let me do a one minute recap. I have taught you that there are four kinds of destiny helpers. Let me run through them very quickly. Number one, they first are called divine connectors. They do not have the solution to your challenges, but they know who has that solution. And they always are bridges. For instance, the slave girl connecting Naaman to Elisha. Divine connectors do not have the power to solve your problem, but they know somebody who knows somebody who can connect you. And statistics tells us that everybody is maximum of four people away from where your solutions are. No matter how serious that problem is, four people strategically arranged will connect you and your solution. Number two, men of influence. The second category of destiny helpers, men of influence. These are men who have the credibility, they have the track record, they have the ears of the territory. Their endorsement about you and they are speaking over you can rewrite age-long narratives in a moment. One person can sign a signature and say, truly, this man is supposed to go to prison, but at my influence, I write something and that's it. Can I tell you, God still works with men no? and there are men who are gatekeepers, whether they are believers or not. I've told you that there are gatekeepers you don't cast away. God grants you favor to be able to pass through them. Some of you have been grounded at this point. Afflictions have remained indefinite in your life because you do not understand the power of destiny relationships, the power of destiny helpers, men of influence. One person, his signature can give you a job. His signature can veto whatever limitation and grant you access. Everything you see on earth is controlled by men. Behind every system is a man. And that man has a will, he has an emotion. Even if he's the unrighteous judge that was in Luke 18. A man who does not fear God nor regard men. That's a dangerous man. May you never meet such a man in your life. I say, may you never meet such a man in your life. A man that does not fear God and does not regard men. You can't talk to him about God. You can't bribe, you can't do anything. You're in trouble. Does not fear God, does not regard men. But the Bible says a weak woman came and used a strategy to weary that man away until he avenged her adversaries. There is always a man behind every system on earth. And let me tell you, when God wants to help you, he gives you access to great men. Don't insult great men. Don't insult rich men. Don't insult people who have paid the price to rise to certain positions. Rather, obtain wisdom by God and say that God should strategically position you. Joseph, you need Pharaoh to manifest your destiny. Daniel, you need Darius, you need Nebuchadnezzar to manifest your destiny. And these are systems and people who God himself recognizes. Are we together now? Number three, you need gifted men. I'm teaching, I'm just doing a quick recap on destiny helpers to buttress point four you need gifted men especially for many of us here who are businessmen or even men in ministry one gifted person can save you financial leakages one gifted person can bring efficiency to your life beyond your imagination the best corporations in the world sometimes are behind them are a few intelligent people who are making global impact redefining civilization the whole corporation is sharing the glory but the truth is that the brains behind them may not be more than four or five gifted men finally and maybe not most importantly, but more importantly, burden bearers. I told you that the assignment, burden bearers are not after your titles. They are not after whoever or whatever you are. They are after you as a person. Burden bearers may not be able to move you forward, but they have an assignment to stop you from going back. These are men who will cry with you. These are people who will see your nakedness and still cover you and cry with you. May God send burden bearers to your life. In the name of Jesus, the Son of the living God. 
Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered him from them all. So the charge here is to build godly relationships and to make meaningful contributions within the spiritual family that you find yourself. You are in koinonia here. Make, I'm not talking of finances. Finances about the least contribution you can make. Your prayer, your participation, that through your life someone is loving Jesus, through your life someone is encouraged. Someone who would have left the things of God is now drawn back through your life. Hallelujah. Can I give you the last? Number five. What is the fifth biblical strategy when you are in a season of adversity of any kind? Engage the prophetic. Engage the prophetic. Engage the prophetic. Hosea chapter 12 and verse 13. Hosea 12 and verse 13. And by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt and by a prophet was he preserved. One more time. And by a prophet, the Lord. It was the Lord that did the deliverance, but he used a prophet. And by a prophet was he preserved. Every time believers went through seasons of adversity, seasons of affliction and tragedy, midwifing their breakthrough were the ministry of prophets. Is it the exodus of Israel from Egypt? Is it the axe head floating in 2 Kings chapter 6 from verse 1 to 7? Hallelujah. Is it the wife of the Shunammite? Uh, I mean, the, 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 the wife of the sons of the prophet? Is it the Shunammite woman? Is it the widow in Zarephath? You can name all of these people. Is it Samaria? The land of Samaria going through famine. Every time there was affliction, a negative season, whether to people, whether to nations, whether to businesses, Affliction can never turn to victory, isolating the prophetic. Genuine, authentic, apostolic, and prophetic ministry has a role to turn people's captivity around. It is a mandate and a mantle that God has placed. Listen to me. Let me assure you, God has anointed men. God has laid his hand upon men. Men that if you believe and open up your heart to receive of the spiritual investment in their life, I guarantee you like night becomes day, affliction can turn to victory right before your eyes. The prophetic is a potent ministry in spite of abuses. When I say the prophetic is a combination of the apostolic and the prophetic. Yes, there are abuses across the globe. Yes, we hope that God, especially in Africa, will fix some of these excesses and these mistakes here and there. But do not make a mistake of throwing the baby and the bathwater. The, Jesus needed three major prophets in his life to emerge. One, Simon of Cyrene. Two, Anna the prophetess. Three, John the Baptist. Jesus as the word. You ignore the prophetic, especially in the times of adversity. You do that to your detriment. One, prophetic declarations. Do you know? I've told you, when I sit back and I watch people share testimonies, you would think that because God used me to birth this testimony and this has happened so frequently, I should be used to it. Sometimes I stand as a spectator and I'm watching the wonder-working power of God that with one utterance backed up by the anointing of the Spirit, like that which will come upon someone this night, in the name of Jesus, that you'll see doors just like that. Because, listen... The Bible says he confirmed the words of his messengers. He confirmed the words of his messengers. One prophet stands over Samaria and says, by this time tomorrow. He was not speaking to a company. He was not speaking to a region. He was speaking to a whole nation. And a foolish advisor stood by the king and said, no, this cannot happen. Let me tell you the truth. Be careful what you say cannot happen. The kingdom of God is a compendium of infinite possibilities waiting for you to engage with understanding. And one of it, I assure you, is the prophetic. I have watched with all humility people rise from grass to grace by the, at the instance of the prophetic. I am a beneficiary of the prophetic myself. Speak and doors just open. Oh, let it be well with you. Let doors be open and that's it. 
I'm telling you, it is it's still a wonder how the prophetic works. That one declaration and the spirit of wisdom moves in motion. And even if it is four lepers, the Holy Ghost will begin to arrange insignificant conditions that insist and ensure that you come out of that situation.